Hey, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense, and today we continue our physiology playlist. In previous videos, we have talked about cholinergic and adrenergic, muscarinic versus nicotinic. Today, we'll compare between epinephrine and norepinephrine, also known as adrenaline and noradrenaline. With that said, now let's get started. As you know, your autonomic fibers in the spinal cord start from the lateral horn cell. And all of this is called preganglionic. Then you have your dozy ganglion. After that, you have many postganglionic fibers. Sympathetic is fight, flight, parasympathetic is rest and digest. So, epinephrine and norepinephrine are here. They are fight, flight. Sympathetic is thoracolumbar, parasympathetic is craniosacral. Let's talk about sympathetic. What do you mean by thoracolumbar? I start in the thoracic or lumbar spinal cord. And then what? And then I relay in the paravertebral ganglia or sometimes in the prevertebral ganglia. But now we're talking about epinephrine or epinephrine. Yes, I'm telling you. Every preganglionic fiber secretes acetylcholine. However, postganglionic sympathetic fibers secrete norepinephrine. They never secrete epinephrine. So how about epinephrine? Epinephrine comes from your doozy adrenal medulla. How can I reach her? You reach her basically by going this way. Coming from the thoracic area, all right, do not relay in any ganglion. Do not relay, all right, just continue until you reach your adrenal medulla. All of this is called a preganglionic sympathetic fiber secreting acetylcholine onto the adrenal medulla. Then the adrenal medulla is gonna secrete some epinephrine and epinephrine and epinephrine and some norepinephrine into the bloodstream. This ganglion has no postganglionic fibers. What is the name of that long fiber? This is part of the greater splanchnic nerve because your adrenal medulla is in the abdomen. It's not in the pelvis. Anything in the pelvis is lesser splanchnic, but in the abdomen, it's greater splanchnic. So sympathetic wants to reach my abdomen. This is the greater splanchnic nerve. The sympathetic nervous system supplies your adrenal medulla and then your adrenal medulla is going to secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine. But most of the secretions of the adrenal medulla is actually epinephrine, about 80%. What is the difference between postganglionic sympathetic fibers and your adrenal medulla? Big difference. The postganglionic sympathetic fibers can only release norepinephrine. Only. Never ever epinephrine. Why not? Because they lag the enzyme that converts norepinephrine to epinephrine. What's the name of this enzyme? PNMT, which stands for what? Phenylethanolamine N, which means normal methyltransferase. What do you mean by normal methyltransferase? I will add a methyl group into the normal position. What's the normal position? I mean, the good position. That's why you convert the valuable norepinephrine into even more valuable epinephrine and more potent, by the way. Your adrenal medulla, on the other hand, is capable of releasing both epinephrine and norepinephrine. How come? The adrenal medulla does possess the PNMT enzyme, phenylethanolamine N-methyltransferase. Therefore, your adrenal medulla can make norepinephrine and not stop. Continue into making epinephrine from the norepinephrine. In other words, epinephrine is just a methylated norepinephrine. That was deep. So the difference between them is just a methyl group, which tells you the importance of SAM in biochemistry, which comes from methionine. If this is your adrenal medulla, you go like this, phenylalanine, tyrosine, dopa, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. Why? Because I do have the PNMT enzyme. Perfect. But if I am a sympathetic postganglionic nerve ending, I can only release norepinephrine. Never epinephrine. Why not? Because I do not have the PNMT enzyme. Perfect. What's the function of the PNMT? Add a methyl group into the normal position, transforming norepinephrine into the even more potent epinephrine. Where do you get the methyl group from? From the methyl donor, Sam. Where is Uncle Sam coming from? From the amino acid methionine, which came from methylene THF. That's some solid biochemistry for your gluteal region. Methylation is a double-edged sword. It can add methyl group to the end position, giving you something valuable, such as epinephrine, or it can add a methyl group onto the O, which means the zero position, giving you some pieces of trash. PNMT enzyme will add the methyl group into the normal position, converting norepinephrine into the even more potent epinephrine, and that's epic. However, COMT enzyme, catecholamine O, which means zero methyltransferase, transfers the methyl group into the O, or the garbage position, 
and this converts epinephrine into degradation products or inactive metabolites or just trash. You're either building up great stuff or you're just tearing down civilization. Epinephrine and norepinephrine, let's talk about the similarities. After this, we'll talk about the differences. Similarities, both of them are released by the adrenal medulla. Both of them are hormones. Both are chemical transmitters. Both are present in your central nervous system. Differences, epinephrine cannot be secreted by the postganglionic sympathetic fibers. However, norepinephrine can. More differences, epinephrine is 80% of what's coming out of the adrenal medulla. Norepi is just 20%. Chemistry, epinephrine is the methylated norepinephrine. Inactivation, how do you inactivate epinephrine? By the COMT, oh, because the zero position converts epinephrine into pieces of trash. Norepinephrine, the main mechanism is active reuptake. Receptors, epinephrine can act on alpha and beta receptors equally, which makes it very powerful because beta is very important because it's in your heart. Norepinephrine acts more on the alpha than the beta, which makes norepi less potent than epi. Why? Because norepi doesn't have a robust beta, which is actually what matters because your beta is in your heart. Actions of norepinephrine are longer and stronger, no kidding, because it's more potent. Longer, it's removed from your body slowly, and stronger on heart hormones and metabolism thanks to the beta stimulation. Norepi is stronger on alpha found in your blood vessels causing vasoconstriction increasing your total peripheral resistance or systemic vascular resistance which will raise your blood pressure especially diastolic. Let me oversimplify stuff for you. I know this is not the actual truth, it's just an oversimplification. Systolic blood pressure depends on your cardiac output. Diastolic blood pressure depends mainly on your systemic vascular resistance or the constriction in your vessels. All of the preganglionic fibers are cholinergic. Translation, they secrete acetylcholine, but all of the postganglionic fibers, uh, they share nothing in common. If you're parasympathetic, you'll secrete acetylcholine. But if you are sympathetic, you'll release norepinephrine with the exception of sweat glands. Adrenal medulla, it's a modified ganglion. Treat her like a ganglion, which means acetylcholine in the preganglionic. It has no postganglionic. It just dumps epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. All right, pharmacology, baby. So here is baseline. Here is you before receiving any drugs. And here is you after receiving a certain drug. Before receiving the drug, you look at this tracing, okay? Upper limit is systolic blood pressure. Lower limit is diastolic blood pressure. In the middle is the mean arterial blood pressure. It's not actually in the middle, it's slightly lower. It's slightly closer to the diastolic pressure because it's two over three. Diastolic plus one third of systolic. It's also diastolic plus one. You know the story, it's more closer to the diastolic. In other words, let's say that your systolic blood pressure is 120 and your diastolic is 80. You might say, oh, the mean is gonna be 100 because it's exactly in the middle. Shut up. The mean is actually 93. It's closer to the diastolic than the systolic because just follow the equation. Okay, this was me before before receiving a drug. Okay, now after receiving a drug, this happened. Oh, look at the systolic blood pressure. It's increased. Now the upper limit is here. That's your systolic. How about my diastolic blood pressure? The new diastolic is here. It has gone up. How about my mean? Your mean is here. It also has gone up compared to your baseline. How about the heart rate? If this happened like this, now this is bradycardia. So this is the normal tracing. Okay, imagine that this is the normal. Tachycardia will be like this. Look at this, it's narrower tracing. The distance between every each two is declining. But if it happened like this, this is bradycardia or decreased heart rate. That's a wider tracing. Pharmacology, we have talked about this before. You can have nicotinic agonist or nicotinic antagonist. You can have muscarinic agonist or antagonist. When it comes to agonists, you can have direct agonist or indirect agonist. What do you mean by indirect agonist? I mean a cholinesterase inhibitor. Next, alpha. You can have alpha agonist or alpha blocker, beta agonist or beta blocker. Today, we'll talk about famous alpha and beta agonists. We're talking about epinephrine and norepinephrine, as you know. Here is norepinephrine release from the synapse. Norepinephrine can act on alpha receptors 
or beta receptors. What kind of alpha? I can have alpha 1 or I can have alpha 2. This is called negative feedback because alpha 2 is anti-sympathetic. It decreases the release of norepinephrine, but alpha 1 is pro-sympathetic. When it comes to beta receptors, we have beta 1 in your heart, beta 2 in your bronchi, and beta 3 for lipolysis. Now let's talk about adrenergic medications. We have direct acting, indirect acting, and mixed acting. Today's topic is mixed acting. What does that mean? They act on alpha and beta. It's just more than one. It's not just alpha agonist or alpha blocker. No, like epinephrine acts on alpha receptors and beta receptors. That's a mixed agonist. Nor epinephrine is an agonist on alpha and beta, but it's more agonist on the alpha than the beta. Look at the beta one, so tiny it's unbelievable. Beta two has left the chat. Now let's talk about alpha one. Okay, I'm alpha one, I'm gonna squeeze your arteries. When you squeeze your arterioles, you increase afterload, which will increase your diastolic blood pressure. Look at the diastolic, it has gone up. Let me tell you about beta one. Norepinephrine has some beta-1 which will increase all of your cardiac properties. It's positive chronotropic, dromotropic, enotropic, and bathmotropic. It will increase your heart rate, conduction loss, and contractility. When you increase heart rate and contractility, the systolic blood pressure will increase. Also, don't forget that alpha-1 will squeeze your veins, increasing your preload, which will increase also your systolic blood pressure. So, here we have increased systolic blood pressure and increased diastolic blood pressure. But the rise in the systolic was greater than the rise in the diastolic, and that's why your mean arterial blood pressure has increased. If there is increased mean arterial blood pressure, as a negative feedback, as a baroreceptor reflex, you can experience reflex bradycardia, you can thank the vagus and the M2 receptors. This is parasympathetic. What's gonna happen to my heart rate? It depends. Your heart rate just by the beta 1 can go up. By the reflex, bradycardia can go down, so it's just a matter of who wins. Epinephrine, on the other hand, it's alpha and beta, and it's an equal agonist on the alpha and beta, and beta 2 did not leave the chat, beta 2 is here. Epinephrine is dose-dependent, however. At low dose, it acts as if it's an isoproterenol. What does that mean? Beta 1 and beta 2 agonist, equally. At high dose, however, epinephrine acts as if it's an orepinephrine. What the flip does that mean? Like the previous slide. It's alpha 1, alpha 1, alpha 1, and some alpha 2 and beta 1. Beta 2 has left the chat. How can I differentiate between epinephrine and norepinephrine since they are almost the same? And here is the differentiation. The hypertension caused by epinephrine can be reversed, while the hypertension caused by the norepinephrine cannot be reversed. What the flip does that mean? Give alpha-1 blockers to each one of them. If you give alpha-1 blocker to epinephrine, you'll just take the alpha-1. Epinephrine still has beta-1 and beta-2. Say it again, beta-2. Oh, it will dilate my blood vessel and lowering my blood pressure. Yeah, reversing the hypertension. Yep, give alpha-1 to the norepi. Okay, norepi, I'm gonna cover your alpha-1. It doesn't have a beta-2. It will never lower the blood pressure. That's why the hypertension caused by the epinephrine can be reversed with alpha-1 blockers, while the hypertension of the norepinephrine cannot be reversed because the norepinephrine lacks beta-2. That was profound. Tell me about epinephrine at low dose. It's an isoproterenol, beta-1 agonist and beta-2 agonist equally. Beta-1 agonists increase all of your cardiac properties. This will increase your systolic blood pressure. Beta-2 will dilate your vessels, lowering your systemic vascular resistance, decreasing your afterload, and therefore decreasing your diastolic blood pressure and overall decreasing your blood pressure. Now this is the most important slide in the entire stinking video. Epinephrine is dose dependent at low dose, intermediate dose, at high dose, different scenarios. Please don't forget that epinephrine is alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1 and beta 2 agonist. At low dose it's an isoproterenol, beta 1 and beta 2. Beta 1 will increase heart rate and contractility, therefore increasing your systolic blood pressure. Beta 2 will dilate your vessels, decreasing afterload, decreasing your diastolic blood pressure. But the decrease in the diastolic was greater than the increase in the systolic and that's why the mean blood pressure will drop slightly. So what happened to the pulse pressure? The pulse pressure, the difference between systolic and diastolic, it has increased dramatically. Tell me about epinephrine at high dose. It acts as if it's an norepinephrine. So this is the exact same graph that we have talked about two slides ago. So please refer. Third, epinephrine at intermediate dose has some alpha 1 and beta 2 and both of them hate each other. Don't believe me? Alpha-1 is gonna try to increase your diastolic blood pressure. 
but beta 2 will say not under my watch because I will dilate vessels and decrease blood pressure and actually beta 2 has 1. Alpha 1 will say okay I'm gonna constrict your veins increasing your preload and increasing your systolic blood pressure. Beta 1 will agree with that and also increase your systolic blood pressure. The end result is systolic has increased, diastolic has decreased, mean blood pressure has remained the same. How about the heart rate? Since it has some beta 1, this can actually increase heart rate. How about reflex bradycardia? It's not going to happen because the mean did not change. How about reflex tachycardia? It did not happen because the mean did not change, doofus. Epinephrine and norepinephrine clinical uses. Let's go. We use them for cardiac arrest. If you remember the old movies. Okay, I'm having heart arrest. Hey, doctor. The patient's going into cardiac arrest. And the doctor will bring a syringe and actually put it. Strike it through the patient's chest and directly into the heart. It was called intracardiac resuscitation with intracardiac epinephrine. No more. No one uses this anymore. If you see this in a movie. It means they are either not sophisticated or they are out of date. We do not use intracardiac epinephrine anymore. So what if the patient is having cardiac arrest in front of me and I cannot shock? Oh, give intravenous epinephrine. That will help. How about intramuscular? Intramuscular is slower than intravenous and you just said that the patient is dying. Go with the intravenous, baby. We can use them also in heart block or AV nodal block when your heart is so slow. We can use them in as adjunct to local anesthetics. Why is this? Because epinephrine will basically constrict your vessels. This will make the local anesthetic remain in that local location for a longer period of time, prolonging the effect of local anesthesia. Perfect. We can use them if you have hypotension or a shock. But epinephrine only. Do not say nor epinephrine here. These only epinephrine. Anaphylactic shock. Only epinephrine. Have you heard of the EpiPen? It looks exactly like a pen. You carry it in your pocket in, in case you have an anaphylactic reaction. You just tap the epinephrine into your own body. Have you ever heard of a norepinephrine pen? Never. Yeah, because we're actually trying to save the patient's life. Norepinephrine is not that potent. Give me the most potent thing because I'm dying. And that's a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, also in the severe asthma attacks known as status asthmaticus. This is asthma that's not going away. We go with epinephrine and not norepinephrine. Question, does epinephrine help people with hereditary angioedema? The answer is not really. Why not? Because, remember, in good old anaphylactic and all of these things, we use antihistamines, steroids, and epinephrine. Yeah. Why? Because anaphylactic reactions are caused by histamine. And that's why these guys help. But in hereditary angioedema, the problem is not histamine. The problem is bradykinin. So epinephrine is not that helpful. So what should I do to a patient with hereditary angioedema? Any one of these. You can give C1 inhibitor protein infusion, Icataband, which is a bradykinin inhibitor, or others. Racemic epinephrine is not the same as subcutaneous epinephrine. Same drug, different route of administration for totally different purposes. One is trying to help you with your anaphylaxis, the other is trying to secure the airway. That was just a quick glimpse of the goodies that you can get by getting my autonomic pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalist.com. You can download it today to give you robust pharmacology knowledge so that you can help your patients better. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my pharmacology courses. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalist where medicine makes perfect sense.